So welcome. My name is Daphne Weisham. I am a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies and also a climate policy fellow at the Center for Sustainable Economy. And today we're going to be talking with some students from a local school here in Portland about climate change and about the future of Portland, Oregon as a so-called climate champion, as well as a proposal for a new propane terminal, uh, Pembina, which is one of the largest pipeline corporations in the Canadian tar sands, wants to build a propane terminal at Terminal 6 in Portland, Oregon, and it's created a bit of a controversy. Uh, and so we're also going to be hearing from an attorney who represents our Children's Trust and he'll be discussing some innovative policies that have been advanced here in Oregon, in Eugene, and perhaps in Portland, Oregon, to tackle the climate crisis on behalf of future generations. So thanks for joining us, and with that, I'm going to start with Nick. Nick Caleb is a Climate Law Fellow at Our Children's Trust. Thanks for coming in today, Nick. Thanks, um, tell us a little bit about Our Children's Trust, and um, how did this all get started? Our Children's Trust came into existence about four years ago, and what they did was take the work of a scholar named Mary Wood, um, who built upon actually centuries of legal precedent in our legal history to advance this idea called the Public Trust Doctrine. And the Public Trust Doctrine basically says that some things are so vital to the public that they can't be entrusted to private interest alone, and they have to be protected in the interest of the public, not only for present generations, but also for future generations. And so Mary Wood at the University of Oregon was able to revive this doctrine. It had been around for a really long time um, in American, early American law. It's sort of been forgotten since the age of statutory environmental law. And we've reanimated it with a new spirit around climate change. And so our Children's Trust has taken this public trust doctrine. And we have advanced this in every state in the union and also in the federal government, demanding that um, our governments uh, hold the atmosphere in trust for present and future generations and protect it. Um, one thing that's interesting about the work that we do is that we always have youth plaintiffs. And we very much, uh, we work very closely with youth in order to have them advance these campaigns on their own because um, we think that they have the a responsibility to do this work, but also that their voice matters the most because they're going to have to deal with the effects of climate change more than generations that are older than they are. And speak just um, about what you were able to achieve in the city of Eugene recently. So I was hired specifically um, as a local uh, climate law fellow to advance a campaign that started Eugene. So a lot of the work that we've done before uh, recently has been uh, with the judiciary. We've asked courts for relief. And um, a bunch of youth in Eugene, with our Children's Trust help, was able to, uh, were able to pass a climate recovery ordinance. And it's the first of its kind in the nation. Basically, what happens is that the city of Eugene binds itself to the best available science on climate, um, which is that we need to reduce global emissions um, to 350 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by the end of the century. So Eugene took the step of binding itself to that best available science, and now they run all of their city planning policy through the specter of 350 parts per million. And um, so it was groundbreaking at that it was a step in a, a, a declaration that they were taking this problem seriously. It was also groundbreaking because the entire campaign was run by youth. Um, they advanced this, they did art, they did their own public relations, they met with the city councilors, they constructed their own testimony, and they were able to get this passed more or less on their own. Um, and so we seek to replicate that all throughout the Northwest and hopefully throughout the nation. So we have some extraordinary young people here who are going to be talking with us about the work that they're doing on climate change. But first, I wanted to introduce Jan Zuckerman. She's Hi. a teacher, and she's worked at Sunnyside School. And tell us a little bit about this school, because it's an unusual school here in Portland. Sure. sure. Yeah. Um, the school was started in, I think, 1994 mm -hmm. and uh, as a focus option, Portland Public Schools. And it was, an, it was just called the Environmental Middle School, so it was a program. And um, basically it drew from, we just drew from students from all over the city with the idea that if you bring students together, children together, and connect them to the natural world and to each other, that they'll care about the world around them. Mm -hmm. And they'll mm -hmm. also care about other neighborhoods besides their own because they'll know someone from that place. And so their own neighborhood becomes bigger 
So mm-hmm. the idea that your mm-hmm. your backyard is bigger than just where you live, and so the idea was to connect kids to to the natural world, and that's how it started. And there were you know just about 120 kids to start with, and then it grew into a K-8 school. So now it's Sunnyside Environmental School. It moved since then, and um, and then we one of the big parts of the school is that we take kids out in the field um, weekly. So the kids get out of the building Mm -hmm. and they learn about issues related to the natural world. So, And for years we really didn't really even focus too much on the climate climate Mm -hmm. change because it's so scary for kids and we Mm -hmm. weren't quite sure how to It's a tough issue to to talk about. Yeah, how to approach it without scaring them or feeling such a downer. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things we do at the school is service learning. So when you combine service and action, then you mm-hmm. can tackle some of the harder issues. And so a couple of years ago, we really we had a climate t- change teach-in, mm-hmm. and the kids were really given an opportunity to develop a plan, an action mm-hmm. plan, and then take take action, do something to mm-hmm. make a difference. And these are two graduates of Sunnyside <coughs> that we have here yeah. with mm-hmm. us today. So. Uh, I've got Mia Bolte. She's a ninth grader, no longer at Sunnyside, at Cleveland High School. And also Sydney Yelton, who's also a ninth grader, and you're at David Douglas High School. Yeah. So I'll start with you, Mia. Um, so you uh, are engaged in the climate issue in high school, is that right? Um, yes. Uh, like I try to tell people, and it's just coming from Sunnyside, um, people know so much about it. People are so aware of how big of an issue it is. Mm-hmm. And I feel, since we do live in Portland, everybody knows that climate change is real, but I don't feel like everybody gets how big of a problem it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, like, nobody's really, like, worried about it at Cleveland. And Mm -hmm. that's just, like, a big change Mm -hmm. in perspective, like. You're beginning to see what it's like in a a school where the environmental curriculum is not a core element of the curriculum. Is that hard? Um, sometimes, Uh because just they won't be worried about it or something will come up and they'll be like oh we have time or oh Uh it's not that big of a deal and it's Uh just like yeah and Sydney you have been uh, learning a lot about climate change over the years is that right tell me a little bit about what you what got you first engaged and how you've begun to educate yourself on this issue um you probably started in middle school mostly uh huh um when we Every year we'd talk about it a bit, and then in my second year when I was in seventh grade, Mm -hmm. we had the teach-in like Jan was telling us about, Mm -hmm. and... Did it scare you? Yeah. Yeah. And and did you begin to feel like if you took some actions that that would have an impact? Yeah. And what sort of actions did you start taking? Um, Last year I went to a hearing downtown and I testified you did about the coal exports yeah wow and what did you say you don't have to say verbatim but just the gist of what you said um the risks and why we shouldn't do the let coal go through our state Uh uh-huh and what happened as a result of all of that testimony did the coal export project proceed or was it put on hold do you know yeah it's put on hold it was put on hold that's great Well, um, so in terms of what is happening right now in the city of Portland, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've got this propane export terminal that's being pushed by Pembina, a Canadian corporation. Uh, We have the mayor of Portland on record saying he thinks it's a good idea. Um, And we also have other public officials claiming that it may actually be environmentally beneficial. Uh, because this gas would otherwise be flared or vented in the course of fracking. Now, Mia, you've done a little bit of research on fracking. What do you know about fracking? Um, Well, in seventh grade, we all had to write a letter to um, an official or some some person in a place of power about a big environmental issue that we wanted to learn more about and that we wanted to tell other people that was, like, bad and we needed to stop. And I chose fracking, and... I just learned so much and we watched a documentary about people who were lived near the fracking sites who the gas and leaked into their water and if they held like um, a lighter next to their tap water and turned on the tap it would just 
catch on fire and their animals were dying and so there's the immediate like deaths around fracking and then there's also just of course when the gas is eventually put to use that that just hurts the environment and people more and there's nothing like yes it's a use of energy but other than that there's really no good yep. effects that are linked to it and of course an additional problem with fracking is that there is this problem of methane leakage from what they call fugitive emissions which some studies suggest it could be actually worse than coal um, so that's uh, that's a concern but in terms of how we proceed in the city right now can you tell us a little bit uh, Nick about Portland's reputation as a climate leader and what this would mean if they were to advance this propane uh, export facility. Portland's known nationally and internationally as a climate champion, and we regularly receive awards, especially from the White House, um, because we put forward plans that sound very nice on paper and commit our planning policy to some seemingly nice goals. Um, the problem with the, the Femina terminal is if it actually is allowed to be in place, it will kind of violate this sort of um, esteem that we've brought upon ourselves in a few different ways and potentially turn us into climate hypocrites. Um, the first way is that it's actually going to increase our emissions locally so that we won't be able to be on track for the, the reductions that we've already committed ourselves to. And secondly, we'll be openly profiteering off of the, um, the traffic of uh, volatile chemicals that are being put up into the atmosphere and causing climate change. Um, so we're... and. The way that the city of Portland deals with this is that we don't usually account for sort of what are passed through carbon fuels that come through our our uh, local environment. Even if we store them for a while, if we're not burning them here locally, we just don't count that as a part of our climate budget. So um, that kind of wink and a nudge policy allows us to profit off of the traffic of fossil fuels without actually um, accounting for them. So we, we're a climate champion still, and our emissions mm -hmm. look great locally, but we mm -hmm. contribute to climate change globally on a huge right. scale. And aren't there efforts to try to do life cycle analysis from cradle to grave of fossil fuels so that you can sort of uh, explain exactly what the climate impact of certain infrastructure would be? For example, isn't Governor Inslee trying to push something along those lines in the state of Washington? Yeah, that's the idea. And the when people advance this policy, the idea is if we're doing this life cycle accounting of carbon, then it's going to change the way that we behave around it. We're not going to be able to push it out of sight and out of mind and pretend mm -hmm. that those emissions don't come back to us. Um, I found out a couple of days ago that in Eugene, as a part of the way that they're doing accounting after they pass their climate recovery ordinance, they're actually starting to look at life cycle emissions as a part of the way that they account for things locally. Um, and planners there are actually amazed at how fast their local policy has shifted and how mm. attentive their local figures are now to that. Um, mm -hmm. Since they've sort of committed themselves to playing this game and everybody's taking it seriously, they're actually looking at these things. So it's having, it's only been on the books for a short time and it's mm -hmm. already changed the culture of how they look at um, their local contributions to global issues. So um, what are the prospects for something like the Eugene Initiative taking root in Portland? They're very high. We have such an environmentally conscious population in Portland as compared to a lot of places. Um, really all it would take would be three votes on city council to get that done or comparable majority on the county to push this stuff forward. So it's actually always within our democratic ga grasp. Um, and since Eugene has set this precedent, it's even easier for us. Somebody's already done it. They're already starting to implement it. We can look straight to them and see exactly how it's done. Um, we don't even have to do any additional work. We just have to figure out how it would fit in with the existing system that we have. Now, of course, the Pacific Northwest is under a lot of pressure with fossil fuel exports coming through one port after another or being proposed for one port after another coming by rail uh, from either the tar sands or from North Dakota or uh, other parts of the country. Um, in terms of resistance to this, do you feel that that's the best strategy? Is it protest? Is it testimony? Is it... What do you think, Jan? What's what's the best way forward for citizens that are concerned and for, for young people that are concerned about their future and the climate crisis? Well, probably all of those are important, uh -huh. but I really, I think the legal 
taking legal action and involving young folks in that, mm -hmm. I think is very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's to, be, to have the government be held accountable mm -hmm. and putting that pressure. So whether it's shutting down things for a while, stopping, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, protesting, or however the word is, however we get it mm -hmm. to the government. So um, makes sense. And I, I mean, I, I really like the idea of the, the lawsuit. Mia, would you want to participate in a lawsuit like that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of things that there we can make lawsuits about that the government finds loopholes or different things that definitely need somebody needs to step up and yep. do something. Take take on this issue for future generations. So, Sydney, in terms of. Um, next steps on the uh, propane terminal. We know right now they were planning on holding a hearing on March 17th, but that has been delayed. Um, it will probably take place sometime in April. What do you think young people can do, um, like yourself, that really want to get involved and want to make sure that Portland maintains its status as a climate champion? Um, maybe they could do some research Mm -hmm. And write letters, maybe. Yeah, write letters yeah. and testify go like to the did. hearing. Yeah, yeah. go to the. Was hearing. it hard to testify? No. No. Did you just read out a statement? Is that what you did? Uh, I wrote a pay. I wrote a speech. That's great. What about you, Jan? What do you think young people could do over the next? month or so if they'd like to get engaged in this um, issue? I think they could um, for sure educate themselves, mm -hmm. um, start getting together and coming up with some plans, to some kind of action, deciding what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of ways to, to get involved. Um, and we do have a bunch of petitions that are circulating. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. if there's any petition on behalf of young people, mm -hmm. but... There was actually my students at Sunnyside put a petition together well, they did. and they got signatures and gave it to the um, commission That's commissioners. Great. But yeah, I think doing something more official, mm -hmm. you know, online and getting it out there, mm -hmm. um, I think is it would be powerful. Yep. And um, other next steps, Nick, what, what do you think uh, folks could be doing? I think uh, I agree with everybody else that sort of all of the above strategies are really important. My other hat that I wear is in addition to being an attorney is that I teach in university, so we have a heavy curriculum on climate change, and um, I also teach a lot about direct action strategies, and in my estimation, the things that are the most successful as far as campaigns go are those when you actually can utilize direct action, have strong educational and media components, and then be working at the legal system at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that in the Portland area, we have the tools to do all that kind of stuff, and there are plenty of ways to get involved. I know several coalitions that have formed recently with the um, ability and desire to take this task on and so um, as this this propane terminal um, process goes forward and the climate action plan the draft is released in March there are going to be all sorts of opportunities for people to make their voices heard and to demand significant change. And what about at the state level we've got a new governor in place now um, is it possible to take your initiative our children's trust and advance it n instead of going city by city actually say this should be a tool that's used in planning the future for the entire state? It could be and we have a lawsuit that's active in Oregon our children's trust says with two youth plaintiffs um, one of whom was featured on Bill Moyer's show recently um, talking about her education she was about y'all age actually younger when she first was a plaintiff is in the case now she's uh, back east going to college but she's back and forth um, all the time and so this case alleged the same thing I was talking about at the beginning um, that Oregon has public trust responsibilities that by not acting on climate change they're failing present and future generations and that we seek the government to implement a climate recovery plan and so that's what we're asking for and so it got dismissed early on and then an appeals court actually said that we are going to get our case and um, on April 8th in Eugene uh, at 2.30 p.m. at the county courthouse, we're actually going to have that hearing, and people are definitely encouraged to go. In the meantime, because the state is a uh, mm -hmm. defendant, you can always send letters to Kate Brown, you can always send letters to the 
Oregon Department of Justice and tell them that you know this is something that needs to happen and maybe that they should be negotiating with us instead of fighting against these public trust obligations. I just mm -hmm. wanted to say yeah. too that you know um, we kind of live in a little bubble at Sunnyside um, because there is an environmental uh, you know, strand through everything that we teach, and so maybe getting out to other schools, having the folks that that you know, getting you out, having some of these folks that you know have mm -hmm. been through the school that really feel passionate, getting out to the other schools and teaching them what they know and um, explaining what's going on, all these things that that are that they could get involved mm -hmm. in, I think is really really important over the next few months. Were you going to say something, Mia? Well, I was just going to say again about educating people. Is mm -hmm. like, like I said, when I came to Cleveland, it's, it's just like how uneducated people were about it. Like, mm -hmm. since we do live in Portland, of course, people do realize that it, it's it's real and it's an issue, but they don't realize how big of an issue or what causes it and mm -hmm. all these other things. And I just feel like for three years, that's like what we learned about in my school. Mm -hmm. So I do feel like that's a big step. It's like in order to make change, people have to know about the change that they want to make, because if people don't know about how big of an issue it is, they're not going to feel motiv motivated to make a change. Now, the Oregonian recently had a an editorial that they published, I don't know if you all saw it, where first they asked their readers what should be the number one topic that they cover over the coming year, and their readers said, climate change? And they wrote an editorial saying, well, actually, we are not going to be covering climate change because we don't think that it matters what Oregon does. What would you say to that, Mia? I, I think it does matter what Oregon does. I think it matters what every state, every city does. I mean, because everything makes a difference. And especially, like, a state has so much power mm -hmm. on what goes on, mm -hmm. like, because a state can make a decision on what things are legal, mm -hmm. like states mm -hmm. can make fracking again not happen in the state, and it's just, and it does matter, like the whole, with the coal train coming through Oregon, mm -hmm. like if it, it had to come through Oregon, and then so it would make a difference if Oregon said, no, we're not going to let that happen. Mm -hmm. And that's happening more and more, isn't it, in Washington and in Oregon? Um, well, any final words from any of you? I think this has been a, a great conversation, and I'm hoping that what we can do with this is share it with other students, other teachers, uh, and get them involved as well. Um, any final words? Um, Sydney? Um, well, yeah, lately I've been seeing signs of definite climate change. The weather has been mm -hmm. really hot the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. That's not supposed to happen in February. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be cold and rainy. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've had just major snowstorms back east, which, believe it or not, can be attributed to climate change, the, the massive dumping of snow that they're seeing in the Northeast. Um, any other final words? Well, just on that, it's like I feel a lot of times is global warming is used a lot more than climate change, and so I feel like people think of global warming instead of climate change, which just mean, oh, the earth is getting hotter, so they don't take into consideration the giant tsunamis or all these other natural disasters that are because of climate change. Mm -hmm. They just think global warming is what the issue is, mm -hmm. when really it's much bigger than that. It's climate change, and global warming is part of climate change, but it's not the entire big picture. And I just found um, some facts uh, about fracking, and it uses 80 to 300 tons of water for like each time a well is fracked. And so not only is it, it's wasting water too. And mm -hmm. We don't, like the amount of fresh water that we have on this planet is limited. very, mm -hmm. very limited. Yeah, and, and it's it, poisoning the water that is being yeah. uh, pushed down underground. But it, but the, at the same time, you know, if it's all, if the, the only information we ever get is the negative, we yeah. don't, we can't envision, envision something different. Right. We just feel so overwhelmed. So I think that, you know, seeing what, what young people are doing or what can be done or a different mm -hmm. way of doing things is really powerful and we need to get that out there. Yeah. Any, any websites you want to put out there, Nick? 
Sure. Um, the website for my organization, Our Children's Trust, is just ourname.org. So it's ourchildrenstrust.org. We have a lot of material um, if folks want to get involved with the struggle in the Northwest or actually anywhere. You can email me at nick at ourchildrenstrust.org. Um, we also, on our website, have a, a film series um, our, about our plaintiffs. So we've profiled nine of our, our lawsuit uh, plaintiffs around the country, and they're very widely distributed, and people like those a lot. They, they tell a great story about why these kids got interested, and mostly, you know, average youth that found themselves in a place where they were given the tools to make a difference, and they have done so. And I'd like to just say that um, if people who are listening want to get involved, there is a coalition called the Climate Action Coalition, and it's climate-action-coalition.org, and it includes our Children's Trust and uh, the group that I work with. Um, so we encourage you to get involved if you'd like to with our coalition, and to find out more about our work at the Center for Sustainable Economy, you can go to sustainable-economy.org. And thank you. Uh, just all one of other you. thing that yeah. rethinking schools. Uh -huh. um, if, if you look online, I, they, they just came out with a climate change. Um, they're just putting together all sorts of things that are happening. Different um, teachers around curriculum around climate change, and that's coming out. So there Great. are lots of things happening. And how can they find out more? I about think that? they can just go to rethinking schools um, online. Dot org. Yeah. Dot org. Okay. Or, yeah. Great. Well, thanks all mm -hmm. for, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having thank us. You. Thanks, thanks for you. watching.